Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hello. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> hey, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Champions of Transition, uh, our first panel discussion of the I'm, I'm only trying to, to gather everyone in a formal way because we're live stream streaming on HowlRound. There we go. I didn't have to guilt you very hard. Again, hello, welcome. I'm happy to see all of you here for the Champions of Transition panel. This is our first panel discussion of Art New York's 2024 Spring Summit. And before I begin, I'm going to um, read a brief land acknowledgement that if you've come to any Art New York program in the last few years, you have heard this. Um, and I invite all of you, whether you've heard it before or not, to really take a moment with this language, take in what I'm sharing here, and think about um, how this does impact your life, how it could impact your life, um, and we're happy to answer questions about this land acknowledgement um, after the panel. All right. Um, we would like to take this time to acknowledge that wherever we are located on Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America. We are on occupied territory. Art New York's membership in the five boroughs of New York City operates on the unceded land of the Lenape, Wappinger, Canarsie, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities. We want to honor, <coughs> excuse me, we want to honor and celebrate all of these indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. We also want to take this time to acknowledge that after there was stolen land, there were stolen people. We want to honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country that we occupy today. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to give thanks to our colleagues from Hands On who are providing um, ASL interpretation for the panel today. I want to thank our friends at Transcend Streaming who are helping us live stream this event on HowlRound. I want to say hi to all of our uh, friends on the internet that are watching us, uh, including possibly my parents. Um, <laughs> now you know what my job is. Um, and also to our colleagues who are helping us with live captioning. Um, okay. Now to some more thank yous. Um, huge thank you to Deeksha Guar, Kristen Marting, and Will Davis for joining us for this panel today. Um, before we begin with my incredibly poignant questions, um, <laughs> let's introduce ourselves to these lovely people, shall we? Yes. Great. Um, Deeksha, I'll ask you to start. And in doing so, can you please share your name, your pronouns, um, your title, or your role in the field? Um, and um, we'll leave it there. We'll come back around to my, my fun icebreaker. Tide, uh, name, pronouns, and your title and or your role um, in the business we call show. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. I'm Deeksha Gore. Um, I, am the, uh, I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm the executive director at TDF. Mm -hmm. Hi, all. I'm Kristen Marting, she, her pronouns. I'm a director and creative producer and the outgoing artistic director, founding artistic director of Peer Art Center. I'm continuing as a co-founding director of the Prototype Festival. Mm -hmm. um, hi everybody, I'm Will Davis, he, him. Um, I am the artistic director of Rattlestick Theater and I am a director in choreography at large. A director in choreography? Yeah, you could be that. <laughs> yeah, own it, own it. Choreographer also. <laughs> Uh, I am Risa Shoup. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. I am a co-executive director of Art New York, uh, and I am a, a very happy audience member. Um, my icebreaker for all of us, since we're talking about transitions, since we're thinking about where we are and where we've been and where we might be going, um, I'd like to kind of invite us to go all the way back to our starts. And could you share in you know just a, a minute or two um, what was your first job in the theater? Um, or if you don't like to say that, um, you could tell us how you found yourself in your current role. And we'll switch it up and we'll start with Kristen and go to Deeksha and loop back around. Cool. 
Um, so I studied directing at NYU, and when I graduated with three friends, we founded our original theater company called the Tiny Mythic Theater Company. Uh, we were young directors. We didn't want to wait for people to let us direct what we wanted to direct. We wanted to make the space to do what we wanted to do, so mm -hmm. we decided to start our own thing. Um, had no administrative or business training, and so generally I just learned by doing things wrong, not to do them wrong a second time. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of is where I got started in it. I really love that. Lisa? <laughs> Thank you. My, um, my um, origin story is also rooted in failure um, <laughs> in that um, I, uh, I was sort of producing a bunch in college and we took a show to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival um, and that was a huge, huge challenge and I did so many things wrong. Um, <laughs> but at the end of it, I thought, I want to keep doing this. I need to learn how to do it right and that sort of embarked me on this journey. Um, uh, the first thing I would like to say is that I got um, kicked out or let go um, of acting school for having, as they put it, no professional potential. <laughs> um, uh, wow. I know. <laughs> and it was a very powerful time for yes. me as a very young people. <laughs> uh, uh, and and found my way to directing through there. But um, I came to the theater originally through dance, which has just been a huge part of my practice. Um, and in terms of artistic leadership, uh, it's always been very important to me to have some footprint of service as I've been moving through my freelance career. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, what, a, what is there to say about that? So um, I had the opportunity to run a theater in Chicago for a couple of years. And um, after that, and when I went back to freelancing, it just became so clear that it was just this emptiness. Like the, the work was wonderful. Um, the rehearsal rooms were wonderful. But it, it wasn't adding up in the way it did when I had the opportunity to work inside a community and work with a sense of longevity. So um, it just became very clear to me that this is what I would like to do. Hmm. I love that. Um, I went to Skidmore College. I don't see any classmates here. <laughs> and uh, you don't know. Uh, maybe. <laughs> there, uh, that's true. I never know on the internet. Uh, and that there were, there's a group of um, Skidmore grads a couple of years ahead of me that had started a theater company called Fovia Floods. And uh, my first job uh, in the theater uh, was to stage manage for them. And none of you are surprised that I was, I had a brief life as a stage manager. <laughs> Fovia Floods became a theater that I think we all know today called the Bushwick Star. Mm -hmm. um, so my <laughs> very first job was uh, in a prior iteration of the first theater that was the Bushwick Star. Um, and I, I think about that version of myself a lot and what mm -hmm. they have learned and what they have yet to learn. And I'm extremely grateful for that experience, which indeed I did make some big mistakes and was given a lot of grace. And that's mm -hmm. something I try to share with um, everyone I work with. Mm -hmm. um, it was amazing. Um, all right, shall we dive in? Are we ready? Yeah. Excellent. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so, um, you know, as we mentioned at the top, um, some of you are transitioning. Well, we're all, aren't we all always transi transitioning into and out of things? Yes. We are all transitioning yeah. every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. And we die, and then we keep transitioning. <laughs> <laughs> End of panel. Thank you so much. So, uh, so just so you know, yes. you are all transitioning and have transitioned. Just yeah. want you to know. I really love that. Yeah. We yeah. couldn't have planned that. Uh, that's really beautiful. Um, so yes, with that in mind, um, I have some questions that are a little more focused on some folks' roles, the newness of it. I have some other questions that are focused on um, kind of like people's pasts and where they've been. Um, I might ask a question of a particular person or people, but I encourage you all to answer or share whatever you feel comfortable sharing, including telling me pass. That's totally cool. Um, and also ask me things. This is, uh, I am not an expert. Uh, on anything, and I hope for a robust dialogue uh, between the four of us, if nothing else. All right, I'm really beginning now. I guess I love to have beginnings. Okay, <laughs> Will and Deeksha, what is the most surprising thing about taking on a role after a long time leader? Mm. Wanna go first? <laughs> 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 Well, um, 
I, you know, one of the things that I, you prepped me for this question, so I should be more articulate <laughs> than I'm being, but, um, you know, when I went through the interview process for this role, um, it was, there was so much there about, you know, the next chapter and what will it look like in the future and all of that, you know, sort of very future looking. And I think sometimes when you have an organization that has um, had, you know, a single leader for a long time, or in fact, often job descriptions tend to be responses to what maybe didn't exist before, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I, was really excited about in my conversations with my predecessor um, as we move forward that there was just such a sense of excitement and energy about going on this journey. And I'll talk later about what a huge support she has been and continues to be. Um, but you know, you walk into these rooms and you don't know what the what the baseline is, what you're going to be working with. And I was just really surprised. And, and thrilled by people's willingness to embrace the idea of change, even while change is scary. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was um, that was really exciting. And then everything else is just a, you know the surprise moments are in every small moment or big moment because it's all new and you're learning so much. Um, but it has been it's been great so far. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, uh, we are in slightly similar places in terms of how long we've been in our jobs. I just hit a year. You hit a year in August. I yes, I will, yeah. Um, and so in May, I thought to myself, oh, I wonder if the fugue state will now recede. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the sort of incredible um, hypervigilance that comes from uh, feeling like though you have facility with all kinds of things, the organism that is the institution is something that you're continuing to learn. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, one of the things that um, I guess has been surprising to me, it, it's, I guess it's really obvious, but it just occurred to me, ah, right, when you take over an organization for a certain amount of time, you, you are living inside the brain of your predecessor. Mm -hmm. um, because you're, the manner in which they um, think the manner in which they lead and delegate and plan, the staff is set up to support that mm -hmm. manner of working. Mm -hmm. um, the board is set up um, to support or sometimes not support, you know, that manner of working. And it and it takes a minute to say, aha, here I am inside um, what has been. So there's this sort of, I think, fallacy about transition um, that there can be a before and an after. Um, and I think, uh, so what happened on May 1st is that, or, or thereabouts, is I, I woke up and thought, aha, um, I don't know anything and I no longer care. Uh. And that shift mm -hmm. of, of like, great, you know, that really sure. felt like, oh, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what it means to like click over a little bit. Um, one of the things I share this with you that um, was really surprising is that, and I know we'll talk about this later, but the, the care that was put into um, the, uh, the, the space I was able to share with my predecessor mm -hmm. and the care that she put into introducing me to people with her mm -hmm. um, is so mm -hmm. smart and so simple. And sometimes it's not possible yes. if you can't plan. Um, but I think in terms of your question about taking over from someone who has been there for a while, what, what clearly um, she and the company had thought about was in order to start shifting a relationship, the person who holds it has to say, I'm shifting this relationship because change is scary no matter what. And so the like ritual of that, of like, I am asking you to start seeing this person, um, mm -hmm. I was, uh, again, simple, but I was surprised by that. Mm -hmm. um, and it really set me up to start my journey. So that this is just to say, I didn't have to do a round of cold calls to begin, because I had done the last meeting that my predecessor was going to have with her. That's really beautiful. Oh, that's yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It helps to build trust right. that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, for, for all of you, 
Um, is there something that you would share with someone who is going to take over again after a long time leader? Not for the institution, but for that individual. Is there something that any of you would want to tell them? You know, one of the things, the ways that Tori supported me, um, which um, was really fascinating, you know, Tori is an educator, she's a teacher, she nurtures um, minds and encourages people to sort of, you know, uh, grow in their careers. And there were, when we first met, there was a moment where she said, um, I'd ask her questions, and she said, you know what, I'm not gonna answer that one. Uh, I want you to, I want you to, I don't want to um, taint anything. I want you to, you know, really have that moment. And as someone who was walking into an institution where the goal was transformation, um, I actually deeply appreciated mm -hmm. that. It, it, it showed a level of trust mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and in, not in the way of I'm not here for you in a way that I'm deeply here for you and I'll answer your other questions. And so mm -hmm. I think there was something that sort of really helped give me a boost, a confidence boost. And I think walking into a role, um, especially after long-term leader, having that sense of confidence and having people believe in you is such a big part of mm -hmm. what makes you able to do the role. Um, so that, that's something that I just think is, is lovely if you can find ways to find your, your people in your community. Yeah, I have a recommendation, I guess, which is that um, <clears throat> in, the, in that interview process, um, I think it's really important that you insist on meeting every member of the board. Mm. Mm. And if there are members of the board that don't want to meet or can't make time to meet, that then you ask someone to explain the context of that to you. Mm. Um, because that is such an important partnership and having an understanding of like, does this group of people have a taste for adventure? Are, are they kind? How many, how many of these people um, have some basis in the theater? How many of these people are coming from other places? What, so uh, I, yeah, I think it's just so important to, before you say yes, to sit down and speak with as many members of the board as possible because it really will tell you a lot about um, a certain perspective on what's possible mm. and also what is the culture mm. like mm. and that can be a great thing and it can be not a great thing but you know when you're landing inside someone else's culture uh, it's not a great idea to just like plant your flag and be like you know this is the god we pray to now and you know what you know <laughs> like that's not helpful for in that chain right mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah it's it's very because we don't make the same thing twice. Every single thing we do is unique. There is no right way to do this. We're making a new way to do it every time. Mm. And that means that it's a much more complex process that we're getting to on the other side. And there's a lot of care that has to be taken to support everyone through that so people aren't left behind or hurt or, or feel they need to leave or whatever that might be. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Mm. Kristen, can I ask you, how did you decide it was the right time to move on? Um, I, I feel like I, I, I've done a lot of things over the years, and I think a big part of the growth of the organization, like it felt like it got to a point where some of the ways that I like working um, uh, weren't as accessible for me because there were layers between me and the stuff, some of the mm -hmm. stuff that I really like to do. Um, and um, I also, like, I didn't go to arts administration school to manage a staff of 16 people and yeah. raise $3 million a year and all that. Mm -hmm. I went to school for directing, and directing is what I actually love, and it's the thing I do that I feel like uses all the parts of me. And so I just felt like I was getting further from the place mm -hmm. where I started, and I hadn't meant to, and it's been a joy. It's been, the, here has been the center of my life for 30 years, and it's been an incredible joy. But I also felt like I've brought a lot of myself to it, and what will new people bring to it? And how could here go in new directions and always be fresh and adventurous and exciting? And what, what are those new things that are coming now that I'm in my 50s? 
When I was in my 20s, I brought something very specific. When I was 30s, I did. Now it's time for other 20s and 30s and 40s to take the organization in, in a new way. Yeah. And other voices. Um, mm -hmm. We've had a lot of different leadership structures and a lot of partnerships over the years. But I think it's time for other partnerships and other models and other ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be the one holding the organization back instead of opening the doors for it to keep going forward. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was really. That's so beautifully generous. And I, I know that to be also like very genuine from you. Um, but I, I myself am very taken by this, what you said that you know, at one point you realized there were too many, I wrote down, too many layers between you and what you like to do. And for Deeksha and Will, I wonder in the decision to take on the roles that you've now been in for nearly or now just a year, mm -hmm. do you feel like you're close to the things that you like to do? Like, was that part of your motivation for taking mm -hmm. these roles? I mean, I think you sort of started talking about this with the idea of service. Yeah, but. yeah. I do want to say more. I, I, I feel like I, you inhaled, and I wanted to respect that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was an inhale to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, there was this moment where, so um, I, I worked as a marketing and PR director for the first decade of my career for in the uh, nonprofit regional theater. And then I detoured and worked in tech. I co-founded a startup, which I ran for eight years. Um, it was arts adjacent, but it was definitely my exposure to the tech world. And um, at the point where the TDF job description landed on my lap, I was having, I was having internal conversations about what I do next. Mm. And I could not make sense of my crazy career path. Yeah. And I remember standing outside of Radio City when this email came through and opening this job description, and it made sense of my career. Mm -hmm. um, it just made sense of, of everything that I love to do. And so it was, it, it feels, I actually feel um, deeply aligned with, with the work right now. It feels very close, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. But I'm also in my honeymoon period, so ask <laughs> me. <anything. laughs> mm -hmm. I, uh, just to start um, in a place of resonance, I, um, I had a moment last spring uh, walking to Rattlestick's um, teeny tiny one room office. <laughs> um, and it's also charming. Um, but I had this moment where I, my brain went, right place, right time. And I realized, oh, I've never felt that before, honestly, about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and the gift of that to feel um, in the right place at the right time is so immense, because it feels like I can, I can be in charge of my power to, right now <laughs> mm -hmm. in a way that in other moments I'm trying to fit myself into some other model or whatever it may be. And uh, you know, there's two things, I think, um, as you're saying, from a service point of view, I am so excited about what is possible for Rattlestick because we're so small. And I was looking for a small shop. Mm -hmm. I was looking for um, a theater that was the right size to respond to this moment. Um, and would give me the opportunity to um, not have to have two months of board meetings and consultants and whatever, but that, I mean, I have an incredible board, but that we were a size that we could pivot and make decisions and go there. So from a service point of view, um, I feel um, incredible. Uh, also this spring, um, I, I directed a show and that was wild <laughs> to do those two things at the same time. And I've made a very um, uh, intentional decision to do a show a year or let it be um, for many reasons. But it, it did occur to me that there is a, um, I have to, if, I, if that is my intention, I have to get better at that for the show and for the institution. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is something I need to learn about. Um, because, you know, 
whatever it did to me is whatever it did to me. But I think from an organization level, I was of less use showing up like, ah, mm. like I'm here mm. for the day, everybody. You know, yeah. it was like, who let this like clown on fire like <laughs> come in here <laughs> and say like, I've got just the idea, yeah. you know, like, uh -huh. <laughs> not ideal. Yeah. Yeah, I think finding balance, um, that balance is really difficult. I mean, Kristen, you talked about wanting to get back to directing. Um, and I wonder, I'm going like way off script here, but I don't know, like what, like, do we ever find permanent balance in our roles, you guys? Like, I don't think we do. No. Yeah, I think we find balance if we're fortunate for a particular moment. Um, but I'm just, I'm curious, how are you all finding balance? Or if you're willing to share, like, what do you do in the moments where you're off balance? How do you react to that? Mm. Oh my gosh, yeah, no, I am not balanced in any way mm -hmm. at all, at all. And you know, mm -hmm. I feel like part, part of what needs to happen is my just continuing to say, I am, there is no, there is no balance here. Yeah. And to try and not have like intense reactionary mm -hmm. urgency thinking about that. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, you know, Arts nonprofits are not for the faint of heart. <laughs> a nonprofit of any kind is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a very odd idea, a nonprofit, mm -hmm. you know? And it immediately tips a person over into a sort of like hyper vigilant, like low panic state. Um, and I feel like I know two things about that. One, it is so important that the manner in which I work with that and with my staff is the way in which I would like them to work with that idea. So if I am freaked out and doing, you know, whatever behavior might result mm -hmm. from that, then that is the work culture I'm offering to my colleagues. And I, mm -hmm. I am not balanced, but I definitely don't want that for anybody else. So thinking about how to show up and be um, gentle and uh, slow is something that feels so important. Mm. There's no way you could work 24 hours a day for seven days a week and you would not get to the end of your list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in a way that frees you to say, wonderful, it's the end of the day, I shall see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, you know, that's a thing that I wanna try and promote. But I do know that um, I don't understand how we're supposed to balance. Um, oh, sorry. The second thing I just wanted to say is that in, in nonprofit culture, um, the space between your job and your calling gets really muddy. Mm. And so it's really easy to say, I'll stay late, I'll do this. And it's really easy for other people to say, no, 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 I will come in, I'll do whatever, I'll write to mm -hmm. you tonight in the middle of the night, because there's this calling space where we've been called to do this and not to be bankers like so you know we mm -hmm. and I feel like it's so important to keep trying to remember a deep res respect and love for the calling uh, and um, an insistence on this is the job please go home mm -hmm. and the only way to get someone to go home is if you go home you know mm -hmm. so anyway that was a lot but that's no, that's yeah. I, yeah, sorry. No, no, please. Well, I was going to ask you because you said that you feel so, it, like that you're in such alignment with the work right now. You know, if there, if that, um, either if there's like a response to, you know, how do you leave at the end of the day, or you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. literally and and figuratively. Yeah. Um, or if you can also just share like what that feels like because that is such a uh, that's wonderful. And I want that for everyone. And then, you know, we all know it's not permanent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anything about that? Yeah, sure. Thing. I mean, you know, I think um, I, I, I felt so while I was, I am and remain very excited about the work we're doing, I also felt an immense, uh, immense pressure um, to perform and to build trust quickly and to succeed and mm -hmm. be seen as successful. 
Um, and I have spent, you know, as we all have the last five years watching leaders of color step into institutions at a very challenging time and not be given the support and resources they need. And it was just this fear underlying, uh, you know, underlying like, mm -hmm. this can't happen, this can't happen, this can't happen, right? And so um, this wasn't the cultural context I walked into, um, but that sort of urgency to have an impact quickly was really important to me. Um, I'd also come from eight years of working in the for-profit space and really felt that the w that impact um, should be as urgent to nonprofits as profits are to for-profits. Mm -hmm. And so really feeling this pressure and urgency. Um, and it was um, right after I got the job, which was about a year ago, my husband turned to me and said, you know, um, our lives are going to change. Yeah. Um, and I went, oh, I haven't even thought about this. And he said, it's okay, I got mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And then when I started the job, he sort of said, okay, do what you need to do. I'm handling home life, yeah. right? Just, but, but just be aware that someone else is taking that on for you. Right. Um, and so finally in, in November, I said to him, I promise in January this will change. And I've tried to be intentional about you know, I hadn't been into either of my kids' classrooms until November. I started in August. Mm -hmm. um, and that came with, you know, all sorts of feelings of guilt or whatever, but we went, mm -hmm. worked through it. Um, uh, therapy is great. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, in January, I, I, I really sort of tried to make some shifts um, to show up more, and, 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 and the home life was a good grounding way to do that. Mm. And then the last thing I'll say mm. is that my colleagues have been rock. I mean, the, the number one message I got from my colleagues, um, Mike sitting here, um, was, you know, do not burn out. Yeah. Do not burn out. We need you here. And, um, and at first I was like, ha, 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 that's fine. I'm not going to burn out. And then I, and then I said, Diksha, take it seriously. Yep. They're observing you in a way that you can't observe yourself right now and take it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I have like, you know, I have an, 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 an email. I hope you don't mind I'm calling you out. I have an <laughs> email from Mike sitting in, um, in, in something he wrote about me where he said, she wants to move so fast, but um, some things will take longer and that's okay. And I open that email about once every two weeks mm. uh, just to remind myself that it's okay. So that's sort, of, that's sort of how I approach balance and manage to sort of so far stay in alignment. Yeah. How about you? Ah. Uh, <laughs> I think that I have to say, like, you know, my immediate answer to that question, um, maybe not so dissimilar to what you were saying, is that I, I have two very young children and a, a partner and uh, I love them all very, very much, and I want to be with them. Um, and also, there are very practical reasons why I have to leave at the end of the day. Um, you know, I can't not pick up my kids when it's my day to do that. Um, I, can't, I cannot leave them hanging, they, you know. Not that that would ever be like a great choice, but they're too young. Like, it's just, it, that's not safe for them. Um, and, a long time ago, someone, um, way before I had kids, I don't even know if we were married yet, uh, I was talking to someone who also at that time had two very young children, and I probably asked something like, you know, how, do you, how are you finding this role and balancing, um, you know, having two little kids? And I don't remember who it was. Um, I don't remember where we were when they had this conversation. I just remember that this person said to me, I am a much more efficient worker because I want to get home and be with my kids. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that. I doubted that it would be true for me. Um, but I remembered, that, I remembered someone saying that. And now I can tell you, yes, having kids makes me more efficient mm -hmm. um, because it forces me to achieve some kind of balance, right? Not a perfect balance, not always a satisfying balance, but some kind of balance. So that's. That's part of my, how I do it, is that I want to go be with them. And I also want time for me. I want to do the things that I like to do that have nothing to do um, with my kids, that you know, maybe it's Di and I doing something together. We're certainly going to see theater, being with friends, 
work activities that take you know take place outside of the workday events etc I want time for all of that and I want that time to feel good and I want it to be fulfilling um, but it all resounds back to like I have these people that I'm responsible for at home and I want to be there for them and I want them to see not not always like the rushed harried version of me you know they're gonna get that inevitably but I want them to see like a focused version mm -hmm. um, so that is that forces me to find a kind of balance, I mm -hmm. would say, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would just add that I, I, I lift up so many of the things that you all shared. Um, I think that taking care of yourself makes you able to take care of the staff that you're working yeah. with, of the artists that you're working with, and um, that's been a process for me. I think becoming a parent was the first place where I learned like, oh yes, I have to have limits around this, or I can't, I can't perform for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but then as my, my son is now 25, so I'm on the other, well on the other side of that, but um, I've found the space like just for me to take the time in the morning for whatever the things I'm doing these days. I'm meditating, mm. I'm doing Spanish, and I'm exercising. So I'm doing those three things mm. before I'm doing anything else, and I'm not getting on my email, and I'm not responding to whatever happened in, over the night. Um, and I think also the, the, what you said about understanding that the day has ended, you know, we've instituted it here that emails are only sent between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And so even if someone is working at a different time because that works better for them, it's not an expectation that other people are gonna read it or that they're mm -hmm. supposed to respond to it. Mm, right. So it's just like figuring out what those cares that you can take are yeah. um, that make, you know, you see someone sending an email at three o'clock in the morning and you cannot help but feel terrible that someone is doing that. Mm. Um, but for some people, that might be a productive workspace, work time for them. So you want to be respectful of that. So you're just you're just trying to find what those right, yeah. healthy things yeah. are for you and for the people you work with, and really listening to what their needs are. And you're making choices. You know, I lo I love what you said that you do the you know you do your Spanish and your meditation and your exercise before you do anything else, and that's just a great choice that you made. And we can mm -hmm. all do that. Like we should not. Feel, I think so often we're meant, especially in New York City, I have to say, I think you're meant to feel that like every choice is a negotiation. Every choice <laughs> is a compromise. And like, no, it's just a choice, you know? And it should be a choice that gets you somewhere fulfilling and gets you to do something that you want to do. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I love that. I actually found that um, the busyness helped focus in, in some ways, on scheduling time for mm. the things mm -hmm. that, like I, for me, um, you know, going to the gym once a week has been um, so transformative to my mental health. It is not something I've ever been able to do consistently, but my life hasn't been this calendarized before. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So it's actually much easier to slip in something into a calendar mm -hmm. slot yeah. uh, than I've ever been able to do. And I, and I find it to, you know, those moments, the therapy, the, the exercise, mm -hmm. the hanging out with friends and family yeah. are really key. I've, I feel like a before and there's an after over here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like for anyone who's shame spiraling about how they don't take care of themselves, I'm here for you. <laughs> I, I feel like I have turned into an office chair, you know? Yeah. Like I, um, um, but I, I'm learning a, a lot sitting here. Um, you know, I uh, have experienced in all of the most positive ways, an incredible amount of staff turnover. I have an incredible member of our staff here. Um, and these people matter so much to me. They are so brilliant and they are um, uh, so um, industrious and so um, visionary. And I think all the time about how am I creating space for them to, to thrive and to feel um, cared for and also that like there is a net here and like mm -hmm. tr truly we we will figure out what we need to do and the we will do it you mm -hmm. know um but i think what i'm learning <laughs> right here right now is that is a great thing to focus on but there is no i in my <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um day to day and my my partner certainly um she will never know about any of this but um she, she is sort of like takes me by the shoulders quite often and says like, you need to get some exercise. You need to eat. You need to do these things. And 
I want to promote to everyone else. You've got to exercise, and you need to. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, for your, you know, vegetable. the person who knows me the best is saying, like, what is what is mm -hmm. this? And mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the year click over will shift will shift some of that, hmm. um, and the opportunity for me to get um, to do a year that we made together. Um, and not mm -hmm. even though it is profoundly wonderful sort of working through someone else's programming, um, I think that is going to really shift, yeah. I think, the psychology of it and mm -hmm. also the, we know, we will pick our workflow. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and then you'll pick another one and another one and another one. Right. And, 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 and I said that not to be dismissive, but like, That's exactly. True. You'll pick one and then you'll have a little muscle for that and um, when you have to pick another one, I, may it be easier. Mm -hmm. um, no less dynamic, but easier. Um, I, I wanna focus, refocus our conversation here about a balance and choices in a slightly different way. Um, Kristen, you spoke earlier about um, new models and new leadership at here. And I know that here um, is seeking a, a collaborative executive leadership team at this mm -hmm. time. Um, and I want, I want us all to sort of talk about collaborative leadership. I think, you know, within the theater, um, that's not an unknown quantity, right? Like most theaters have a dual collaborative leadership structure at the top. However, they title those roles artistic and executive director, you know, artistic and managing director. However, that's titled. It is not unknown to us in the theater to have a collaborative executive leadership team. Um, but Kristen, if I could put you on the spot for a moment, could you talk about here's decision to in, have this new version of collaborative leadership? Because I realize, as you also said, um, here has had many different staff structures. So if you could just talk about this current journey a little for us. Sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, just for the background, uh, the original company, Tiny Mythic, was four leaders, ended up being two leaders after five years, and then co-founded here with another company with two leaders. So there were four of us leading here when we first started. Mm. We were also modeled as an organizationally collaborative organization. So we had a bunch of organizations that joined us right when we opened our doors that were all working in the space together. We had no staff, and everybody was doing box office or concessions. It was like a totally like co-op model in the original structure. We've been through many iterations since then. Um, and I served as uh, executive director for a number of years, but then at, at, they at, people asked me to step up. The, there were four of us who founded it, and the others asked me to step into executive director because of issues that the organization was facing in terms of communication with the funding community, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, it was less about the way we were operating and more about the way that outside organizations needed to understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. right. So that's actually how we ended up in that model for a period of time. And then um, Kim Whitener joined and for 10 years or 11 years was a partner with me where we both reported to the board. Uh, when she left, the board felt there had been too much overlap. They wanted a sole report. But I had two people who had been with the organization for many years. And the three of us were really running the organization together, but I was sole report to the board. But I didn't make decisions unilaterally, and I have really never done that in here's history. Um, so with my departure, we had an opportunity to, I'm someone who's learned a bunch of different things over the years, and it didn't seem like it, that was the same thing that we would want to be looking for. And also in terms of how collaborative we've been, we wanted to ensure that collaboration would be at the center of the organization going mm -hmm. forward. Um, but we didn't want to find someone who does programming, and they do programming in theater, music, dance, puppetry, media arts, and they also have done some fundraising, and they've also done some finance. Like it just felt like too many staff management, and all these. It felt like too many things to put on one person, and we really liked the idea of the artistic leadership being able to be shared across multiple people who brought different skill sets to the table, especially because we're multidisciplinary and we're contemporary performance and new work development. There's just a lot of different um, things that we're interested in and finding a, a perspective that could be as inclusive as possible of those disciplines and those mm -hmm. ways of working. Um, so it was really a lot of that that was in our interest. 
And the way that the leadership model has been designed is three leaders, um, all with some artistic, mm -hmm. um, one that has more kind of, and it's being tailored through the conversations that we're having, but within the pocket of all of them, it's like an oversight over marketing, an oversight over development, oversight over general management and staff, like, and culture of the organization, and an artistic. So we have folks that we're in conversation with very actively, um, that we're moving towards um, the right fit um, between also the different people that we're in conversation with and how their different skills fit together. But we did a national search with this wonderful organization, Creative Evolutions, um, and we had about 110, 120 people apply for the positions, and we're in the final stages of that process now. Um, but but it, 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 it never, um, is exactly what you think. And there's a lot of things that surface through the process. Um, we had people internally and staff that we've been in conversation with about their ongoing role with the organization. And so there was a lot of conversation about what they wanted their role to be and how they could work with leadership coming in and making sure that people were cared for through that process. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but it's exciting to feel like a lot of different energies will be guiding where here goes in the future. Um, and that feels really appropriate to the time that we're all living in right now. Yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. I, thank you so much for sharing that and, and for um, taking us back to the, you know, the early days of Tiny Mythic in doing mm -hmm. so. It was really um, enriching to hear about. Mm -hmm. um, and now for all three of you, um, I want to stay with this idea that, that Kristen said to ensure collaboration is at the center of the organization. Um, could you talk about um, how you put collaboration into practice in your roles, whether that's um, within your leadership structure or you know just like how you communicate about responsibilities with your teams? Uh, I'm just I'm so interested in this notion of of how we put collaboration into practice particularly on the administrative side, because I think we talk about that a lot on the creative side, but not mm -hmm. enough on the admin side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a director, um, when I go into rehearsal, I think about the fact that for a, um, a, there is a number of hours today where I can learn what is in other people's brains. Before rehearsal and after rehearsal, I will be stuck inside my own brain. Mm. And I know what my brain thinks, <laughs> but I don't know what other people's brains think. Yeah. And because the form is a group project, the artifact, ephemeral as it mm -hmm. is, requires all of us to create. It is incumbent upon me to know what's in everyone else's brain. Mm -hmm. Because as we, you know, in that mm -hmm. structure, as we start working on a project, we become a brain trust. Yeah and different ideas are being had, whether it's been discussed out loud or not, that build on each other. So making sure that the rehearsal room is set up to receive that mm. um, is something that feels very, very important when it comes to um, uh, staff and work structure. So I think that like nuts and bolts things are um, asking for feedback mm -hmm. and asking for a conversation mm. um, and then uh, figuring out how we're braiding that together and what is the way to move forward. And I think when possible, holding my thought for a second so that it, it we're not like sort of like, um, oh, what's the phrase when uh, we all just start agreeing with each other? Um, confirmation. Confirmation. Bias. Yeah, confirmation bias where we all, yes, yep, that, yep that um, taking a beat before I try and throw in my thing. Sometimes that is, I think, useful. Sometimes it's not useful. Because I think there's another side of this, which is, you know, leadership is leadership. And at a certain point, we were having an experience of this this week, where um, the request is, could you please make a decision? I do not wish to make a decision. You know, mm -hmm. someone is saying that to me. Um, and they're like, absolutely, that is my responsibility. And I think, that's the other piece of it is that however you wish to organize and define collaboration, mm -hmm. which is, is a very, very fungible term, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 
the decision, whether it's made by the group or made by me, the decision is my decision. Mm -hmm. And I need to know that whatever might come back or be the consequence of that decision is for me mm -hmm. to hold and, and work through. Um, but I also think that there, there's such an opportunity for joy inside um, making space with each other, you know, and part of the fun um, of uh, working in environments like this is, is the like, well, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Yeah. And making sure that those conversations are not always predicated on we need to make a choice right now, but that there are conversations that are like, what should we do? Um, so that there's, you know, dream, dream, dream space. Yeah. Too. I really resonate with the piece about, um, well, with a lot of what you said, well, but this piece about, you know, in our roles, we get to take the credit for good decisions. We get to deal with the consequences of decisions that don't go as well as we would hope. And, um, and that's a responsibility to be taken deep, very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I think, maybe provide some cover when trying to build collaboration, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> because um, saying things can be scary in a room, particularly in organizations that have been traditionally quite hierarchical. Um, and so this idea of well, what if I say the wrong thing sort of sits underneath a lot of these conversations and at least in the early stages of sort of building, re, you know, shaping the culture of TDF um, is, is very important to me that everyone had a, has a voice and can speak and not, and actually have this sort of reasonable expectation of failure, which is a phrase I use a lot mm -hmm. and be okay with it, yeah. you know. Um, and you know, we all started with our sort of failure stories yeah. that led us into, into <laughs> these roles. And, yeah. um, and so anyway, so that's, that's really important to sort of set the groundwork for allowing people to fail, yeah. whatever that may yeah. mean. Um, but also, you know, providing sort of guardrails and structures within which you're at least talking about the same things, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just open brainstorming. Sometimes it's that. but. Sometimes it's like, here are the very specific problems we're trying to solve, and here are the parameters, yeah. and mm -hmm. how would you tackle that? You know, um, but certainly living and strongly believing that I rarely have the best ideas in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Rarely. Yeah. But I do think I have a skill in figuring out how to make other people's ideas come to life in, mm -hmm. in, in manageable ways. So yeah. Yeah. that really shapes that. Yes, and to everything that you guys said, but also I think this idea of how um, you can make the space for the offerings to come so mm. that people feel like you really want to know that you're not just looking to say, I, I'd like everyone's opinion, and then you don't really want it. You're, it's not actionable. It's not going to be incorporated. So how um, there's a feeling that um, there is a genuine curiosity in mm. surfacing those ideas and welcoming them. Um, and that there's also the space for um, people to step outside their area of expertise. So um, as we've grown, when we were a smaller staff, we would brainstorm at a staff meeting and everyone would feel free to weigh, weigh in. But as you start to have more people, people are shyer to put their views forward. Mm -hmm. So how you can still create the space where everyone on the team can still feel like their idea can come into the mix and that it's not going to be discounted because they've only been with the organization a short time or they're an assistant, that, they're not, that that's not welcome. So how you can create the space for that. Yeah. Um, and just to add that it's active, it's not just um, the, 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 if you don't genuinely care and you ask, it's actively demotivating. Yeah. Yes. It's not, there's no, it's conscious, right? Mm -hmm. And so we talk about a lot of that with our board, right? Um, sort of, I'm only gonna ask you for specific things. Um, and, you know, or I'm gonna ask you in a specific way because if I keep telling you to give me ideas and I don't listen to you anytime, you're just gonna feel crappy about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I 100% agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that really resonates. I mean, I, um, Deeksha, you were saying that you, you know, you feel 
confident and it sounds like very grounded about the fact that you don't always have the best ideas, but you're trying to like make space for that. And that is, you know, before I very glibly said that I'm a happy audience member, which is my way of saying like, I'm not an artist. And like, that is totally okay. I, I, it's not what I'm trying to be. That's not my goal in life. Um, and I love being an administrator. It's very creatively fulfilling to me. And one of the, the thing that I love most about it is that for me, this job is about facilitation and it is about working with tremendously creative people um, and you know, either supporting them in or creating space for their um, ideas to come to fruition, whether that's our members, other stakeholders, absolutely the staff at Art New York, um, but someone or off in, as in the case at Art New York with a collaborative team has to make that space and again, like that is deeply creatively fulfilling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also the more I can remember that, the, um, the less pressure I feel to have a brilliant idea. Yeah. Like that is so stifling when you feel like everyone's looking at you to have an answer, which is like just a thing you made up in your head. It's very mm -hmm. rare that anyone's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. waiting for you to have an answer. Um, but when, if you can like find a visualization or any, any method to free yourself from that expectation, oh, I think yeah. that's where the best work happens. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's also just um, uh, helpful uh, for workflow. Yeah. That if, the, if you set things up in such a way that everyone is waiting for you to say your thing, then everything you do is gonna go slower <laughs> because it all has That's to filter right. through your brain, you know, like, yep. um, mm -hmm. and again, I mean, I think there's, you know, for obvious reasons, so many parallels with directing. Like I think about this all the time. One of the reasons the room needs to be set up for collaboration in a certain way is that as we move towards tech, um, I'm gonna run out of good ideas. Yeah. And I would love us to be in a space where everyone's, worked the muscle of having good ideas. Mm -hmm. So when everyone turns and looks at me, I'm like, Merp. anybody yes. else? And it's like, yes, we've had all this time to you know, right. do that. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's also just a baseline thing about, um, yes, if everything has to pass through you, you're going to work slower than you intend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, are there... I'm like trying to think about how I want to word this. Um, Kristen, you, you, I know you've mentioned you're staying on with Prototype. I know, and you want to continue directing, it sounds like. Uh, and then, Will, you are trying to find balance between directing and mm -hmm. being the artistic director of Rattlestick. And Diksha, you know, you are looking forward to hitting a year mark. And I, I know you have some, you know, uh, new programs and, other, and new roles coming to the fore mm -hmm. at TDF. Um, what I'm most curious about from all of you in this dialogue around collaboration and making space for new ideas is, is there something you're looking forward to trying um, in any of these roles, in any of the projects that are involved in these roles? Is there a method? Is there a question? Is there something that you are looking forward to trying that's new to you? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I'm so excited to wake up and not have all of the here <laughs> fill my brain first. That's yes. so exciting to me. Yeah. I can't even yeah. tell you after 30 love, years. <laughs> to, we love this yes. for you. So yes, but but and on, on a more sincere level, you know, to st I used to be able to start my day in my directing brain, mm -hmm. and then I would go to my institutional brain. Yeah. And it's been uh, even when I'm directing, it's very hard for me to shake the institutional brain. So mm -hmm. I'm very excited about having that directing brain be guiding me again. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, you know, I, I love this field and I love the work that I've done. I don't want to run another organization. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to work more closely with the work itself and not the institutional frame around it. But I also, I've done a lot of work around um, politics and activism over the yeah. years as a volunteer. And um, I've been working um, with my state assembly member as a legislative strategist mm -hmm. on a volunteer basis. And I'm super interested in um, continuing work in that area. So that is my new fresh thing that I'll be doing that's completely outside of the work I've been doing, 
but it's very, tra all the skills that I've used in the theater are very translatable to what I'm doing, what I've been doing so far. So I'm really interested to see how that could continue to grow. So that is very yeah. exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Rattlestick is beginning um, sort of five year artistic restructuring um, this coming season um, that I, this is how I feel about it. <laughs> we love it. Um, it's mm. an incredibly exciting opportunity for us to do what I think we can do as a small organization, mm -hmm. which is reshape the manner in which we work. Um, and uh, what, I, what I would just briefly say is that all of that, every piece of that, and it's every piece of the organization, um, is about um, increasing the time uh, for inquiry mm. and increasing the time for failure. And um, that just from, you know, we are this little theater downtown and there are so few theaters left downtown mm -hmm. um, that has been dedicated to new work. And we have this really amazing opportunity while we're watching, as, as we're watching, uh, nothing's going wrong. Everything is changing, by the way, mm -hmm. in the American theater, okay? <laughs> like that's, that's what's happening. Yes. Everything is changing and it's scary. And mm -hmm. I feel frightened. But I also know mm -hmm. that I can just accept that. I'm frightened. Fantastic yeah. news. Now let's do things. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, anyway, I've got a little off track there. But no, just I love to that say, you said that. Yeah, the, the big thing we're working on is very simple, which is just adding time. Mm -hmm. As we all know, time is money. Mm -hmm. But what's wonderful is it's only money. You know, mm -hmm. like that's, mm -hmm. and that is, that's the thing to embark on um, is raising the money to get the time. But that's my, my true goal. Mm -hmm. And I am hopeful from a, from a organization standpoint that it will also reorganize us as a staff and move us away from a sort of like one-off feeling of we're doing things, you know, like developments over here and productions over here. There's a commission over there, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. You know, that that kind of scattered and fractured way of working is quite exhausting and it leads to burnout because it's not adding to each other. It's, it's I need to do that and then I need to do this. And so it is my hope that part of adding time means we are with projects long and that they're sort of nesting dolls sitting inside of each other. And there can be a feeling for each of us of, um, we don't, we're not getting to the end of the thing immediately, but, but we are able to judiciously work towards something that has a long-term goal. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I love that. Mm. I'm very excited. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think for, for us at TDF, I would answer it slightly differently in that we've been doing a lot of work um, in the last, I don't know, six to eight months around what I call the foundational work, just laying the foundations mm -hmm. for the way we want to work. And what I'm really excited about is now we got to do the work and see how the foundations work, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So, yes. Um, you know, we, it was, uh, the there is, um, one, of the, one of the many gifts I was given um, when I started at, at TDF was um, uh, some amazing funders uh, who said, what do you need in your transition year um, to be successful? And I said, technology. I need technology. I need tools that will sort of sh start to shift the way we work. And one of the first pieces of technology we got was this product called Culture Amp, and they do 360 degree reviews. It's a reviews platform, but they also do anonymous um, surveys mm. um, that test the sort of health of your culture. Oh, cool. um, and so, and you know, this is the largest organization I've ever run. It's 60 full-time, 100 full and part-time, um, I met with every full-time member, but you know, it was half an hour, you know, whatever. And so we did this survey, and it was great. We learned where the pain points were, and fortunately, they did reflect what people told me. So uh, that was good to hear. Um, but what we learned is that there were certain 
that there was a, a sense of um, silos, right, work silos, um, and then um, there was some sort of broader feedback on how we communicate and how we, how we relate to each other. And so the first thing we did was we created um, a volunteer working group um, to work on community agreements with a hired consultant. And we had 15 people and a 16 person staff volunteer to participate wow. um, mm -hmm. across every department of the organization. Wow. Um, and it was phenomenal. And it, was, it all came from the staff. Um, and I fed in as an equal participant. And when I started to feel like my voice was overtaking the room, I used my busyness to step out. Smart. Um, mm -hmm. They presented to the rest of the staff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, so fast forward a bunch of stuff. Uh, yesterday, we had an all staff meeting where we presented our strategic direction and our, mm -hmm. um, and our new organizational structure to um, the rest, to the entire staff. And it was so, I know change is anxiety making, right? And so we were trying to do it in a way yeah. that even though there was nothing that people needed to be scared, scared of, we knew there would be fears. And I literally could just pull from the community agreements mm -hmm. and say, you wrote these, please hold these yeah. as we go through the rest of this conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that has been thrilling and exciting. I've never done anything like it before, but I'm really excited to see well, this has been great, but does it actually right. mm, I know. It actually help yeah. when the work gets started? And yeah. you know, I'm feeling optimistic, but you know, ask me back next year, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, love that. I love that, I love the idea of giving staff the opportunity to collaborate together, uh, giving staff a t the ability to create a tool that they are then immediately given the opportunity to put into practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I do even love like, this notion of asking you in a year. Like, I will do that. You know, I will come <laughs> know Absolutely. Um, how it all, you know, sort of where you are in a year in terms of using that tool. Um, though I, I suspect um, that will serve you well. And part of why I suspect that is we, not in the same way, but we also developed meeting agreements at Art New York. And they continue to evolve, but it's really helpful to have that, and it's really helpful that they came from within. They're not, though. We take inspiration from other places with, uh, in terms of what what those agreements are. Um, there's a lot of buy-in because they come from within us. Yeah, there's also this interesting moment which may have subverted the process. I hope not too much, but um, was this this really amazing opportunity to analyze our assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. So, wow. so if we take, um, mm -hmm. take this email issue, right? And, and uh, somebody said, no one should be allowed to send an email after 6 p.m., right? And I thought, well, that feels kind of didactic. Mm -hmm. What are we solving for really? Right. Like, yeah. what is the real issue? Um, and we have a lot of people in our staff who are parents who 6 to yep. 9 p.m., nothing is happening, nothing work-related is happening, mm -hmm. but after 9, like, it's, you know, that's work time. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's sort of this interesting moment because we are such a cross-generational -gener organization mm -hmm. to say, okay, well, is this, is this really what we're going for? Is this equitable? Does mm -hmm. this live up to our other values? Or are we, are we treating uh, the symptom, not the cause. Yeah. And so even to begin to engage in conversations around questioning your assumptions, um, making sure you know what you're solving for, yeah. mm -hmm. um, really getting to the root of the matter, um, a lot of that groundwork was laid in that room. Yeah. Um, so that, that I, again, I, I remain hopeful that that will show up in our work. Mm -hmm. um, that. But who knows? <laughs> um, I had a question that I was, that um, for these three folks who have seen the questions in advance, that I was gonna ask uh, of you, Deeksha, but I'm gonna um, shift this, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna ask it of all of us, um, because Will, you brought up this moment of transition that we are in as a field, yeah. um, and I so appreciate both this mm -hmm. notion of resilience that you mentioned in terms of like, yes, I could recognize that I'm afraid, and now what, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let me not spiral into that. Um, and you also talked about how it's change, it's not, it's not a flaw. Um, even if things are breaking, it's not yeah. a flaw, it's just changing. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, also Diksha, you talked about, um, again, sort of like the, the, to my way of thinking, the service from within your staff, right? The, the, the group questioning of assumptions, the building of this new, of, you know, new meeting agreements, um, the testing of that, et cetera. Um, and so my question for all of us is, um, what is your vision for service in this moment of field-wide transition? And I'm asking you this very, very genuinely as the co-executive director of the Alliance of Resident Theaters New York, a service organization of which you are all members, of which these most, you know, I would say the vast majority of these people, if not all of these people are our members. Um, so yes, what is your vision for service in this moment of field-wide transition? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as I like to say, everything is better off the binary. So, <laughs> and part of what's happening. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> um, but part of what's happening is this really binary, like, uh, we did this and now we can't do this. And we're just here. Yeah. We, could, we used to do six shows and now we can only do four shows. And that is the sort of myopic conversation. And when I say what I was saying about like it's change, I don't mean to discount the financial realities of that, which on a personal level and an institutional level, my, my God, I mean, we're all inside of it. And, uh, you know, I, I got a, a nice, a useful email this afternoon with, and Kate and I were working on something else and I did cry because that is how it feels, you know. Uh, it was a good cry. It was a good thing. It was a little release. Um, uh, right, everything's better off the binary. So my interest is in when I can identify a conversation as a field that we're having as a binary, I am not going to enter that conversation. I'll put my hands down. Um, I, I, that's just, that's not a conversation for me. Mm -hmm. And instead, as we all know, because we have to be so fleet of foot and so creative, scenario planning is always the answer. We mm. could try this, we could try this, we could try this, mm -hmm. and we'll try them in this order. You know, and by the time we get to this one, we will have learned something from these two, so that we are allowed an opportunity to grow, and it doesn't feel like a trap. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm saying this because, um, and I am I am fortunate again because Rattlestick is the size it is, that, <clears throat> and because the mission of the organization has been about the creation and promotion. Um, of new work mm -hmm. and what new work is does, does has nothing to do with how old a person is mm -hmm. or where they are in their career or whether or not they've written it down you know like there is new work that exists that is productions that have been made of extant text just to say new work mm -hmm. is a big thing um, yes because I have those two things at my disposal um, I am taking this moment to focus on um, deepening opportunities for artists to build things, as I was saying, slowly. Mm -hmm. Or not slowly, but to focus the organization around attunement to artist process. Mm -hmm. Focus the organization around process, focus the organization around development so that we're not, again, developing over here and producing over here. Mm -hmm. But saying process is programming, like, Sure, sometimes what that looks like might be the, sh the show, mm -hmm. yeah. but the process of creating something and the opportunity to offer audiences and donors and everybody else access to the process of making something is what I understand to be the, well, it's the way that I want to go. I want to let go of um, certain notions about product that say like, my company is not successful if we don't produce X number of shows. And I want to, I want to move away from the, the word seasons. I'm disinterested in it. I'm disinterested. <laughs> I am. In, in any, la I, there's a lot of hands, yeah. but yeah. in any language that defines the time in which a work can take place, I, I am going to experiment with letting go of. Mm. If I say a season, then that means then there are this many shows and this many shows get this much time and that means that we can offer this much money to this many people. Mm. And I think if I can 
release, but tell the story in a way that doesn't make people think I've lost my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if I can try and release those ideas and say, these are the artists and these are the projects, and these are the platforms in which we are going to um, develop their work, and we invite you to see it in these different phases, then I think what I'm doing is trying to, is the service of the care and feeding of artists, is, is the service of caring deeply about what arts and culture is like in New York, mm -hmm. and how it is that, that, that my company is providing a launch or a platform or a place of refuge mm. for people to go deep with their craft. Now, I'm saying all of this, but it feels important to say, our budget is 90% contributed income. So I am not in a situation where I have to sell a million tickets to make payroll work. That, and that, yep. is, that is part of what is lucky. Like, we have 87 seats, a little more sometimes. But you know, like, that number is never gonna sway the budget. It mm -hmm. does mean that I have to fundraise 90% of our budget. But in this moment, I am, I prefer, I prefer that because it's allowing me to say, let me raise money for the artist. And sometimes at the end of that process, when it feels correct, we will produce that play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The end. I really love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Worthy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was good. I don't think you've lost your mind. I don't <laughs> think so either. No, I just I feel like yeah. we're all yelling over here in, in this like parking lot, you know, but there's this huge field over here <laughs> and we could just run through it, you know, yeah. and be like, oh, look at this. Exactly. Okay. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> take, take more time, like especially in the moment, you know, it is true that this is a moment where resources are constrained. You know, Big worldwide, time. let alone in our field. Big time. Like we, are, we, we experience this every single day. Um, so if your resources are, are constrained, perhaps do less, you know, and mm. <laughs> make better use of what you have. That's right. And also, like, remove the burden of a deadline. Yeah. You know, right. Focus you your resources. You yeah. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny because I learned so much um, from the world of tech. And I mm -hmm. did go to school for arts administration. And when the pandemic hit, I thought, well, fat lot of good that did, mm, right? But, yeah. but I did learn a lot from tech. And tech and nonprofits, or er, start, early stage startups and nonprofits are similar in this one way. We are very limited in resources. You need to learn how to do a lot with a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But where we're different is that in tech, if you decide that there's one idea you're going to get behind, you focus all your resources on that one idea, yeah. and you give it the best chance of success. And in nonprofit, you either say, well, we have to do all these other things, and I'm talking in broad generalizations based on my limited experience in the regional, in the regional world. But, um, you know, and then you talk for hours about what you should do. Um, as if there's no cost to that, yeah. instead of just doing things and then s learning from them, right? right? And so, there's, so, true. Mm -hmm. so there's this world where I feel like coming back from tech was super helpful to yeah. just say, you know, like, what do you want to focus on? Mm -hmm. And we're still figuring that out, you know, you, maybe not right away, but I do have a bias towards action rather than than thought and and ab absolutely reframing your assumptions it's it's actually pretty funny my development director and I were talking about this the other day she's like it's not like you've come in and said do this or do that you just reframe every question mm -hmm. and then I go figure it out and I'm mm. like that's great that's sort of my that is my ideal job. Yeah, well done. Not doing any of the work but saying the question differently. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so great. But I mean, to your question about sort of vision, you know, where is this going and where do we serve? Um, you know, again, very influenced by tech, um, sort of like, what is the urgency of impact? And, and, and if we're not chasing impact with the urgency that we would profits, what are we doing? Right. So, so that's sort of a big piece of that. And then also knowing that we'll never achieve our missions by ourselves. Um, and so, in a way, 
I feel very excited to come into the community at a time where everyone is really deeply interested in meaningful partnerships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because you can have conversations with people totally. saying, hey, you do this really well. Can I stop doing it and like hand over to you? And, and, mm -hmm. and, and similarly, yeah. can I take on more of this? Right. Um, and so as I think about TDF's role, TDF used to all, our mission used to always be about, and still is, um, breaking down barriers to access for the performing arts. But it starts with this little qualifier, which sort of suggests that we're doing this to support theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, ah. and in my mind, even if I haven't convinced everyone yet, no, we actually just serve the audience. Mm -hmm. And if we serve the audience, we will serve the theater. Yeah. But in a way, and I hope this doesn't sound <laughs> super arrogant, like if we're the experts on the audience, we should, we should, we should run with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, and I think sometimes we are one of the only uh, uh, service organizations whose membership is the audience. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of think that is our mm -hmm. that is our superpower. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And if and and I I often use the um, the analogy between market, you know, marketing and audience development, which is very much from the nonprofit world, right? Where marketing is, here's my show, here are the tickets, I need to sell the tickets. Whereas audience development mm -hmm. is, I want to build that audience for the future. What are the shows that I can use to pull to do so? Yeah. Um, and that is ultimately what I hope that we achieve at TDF in great collaboration with our colleagues because um, we'll never do it alone. That's right. So. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so great. Yes, agree, 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 agree. Yes, yes. And whatever you figure out, I mean, this, this question of audience is one of the big questions, one of the big moving pieces of the moment. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So it's really paramount. Well, and the, the yeah. question of time is so interesting too, right? So I moved to this country 20 years ago, and the primary conversation around diversifying audiences was that there wasn't work by artists of color on the stages, um, and that we were not, when, and when I was here, like de you didn't see a lot of representation right. on the stage. And 20 years later, the landscape looks really different. Mm -hmm but the audience doesn't. Yep. And the re I believe that it's yep. because we have not invested the development of the in the development yep. of the audience, right? And like we talk about barriers to access, there's financial barriers, fine, that's the easiest one to deal with. There's um, uh, physical barriers, right? Yep. Um, but then there's all the invisible barriers mm -hmm. that we are not even touching mm -hmm. right now. Um, and so I think we're on a 20 year journey. Yeah. I do, I do. I think this is the time for us to like wake up and, and, and focus on the audience for audience's sake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we'll, you know, hopefully 20 years from now it'll look really different. Yeah. We learn that every election cycle, don't we? That like, you know, yeah. diversifying, your voter pool is, you know, a make or break for candidates. Right. Um, I think that's such an amazing point about audiences that you're making that we have not. You, well, that TDF is the, I, to my way of thinking, I think you're the only ASO artist service organization whose membership is the audience, um, and that if we can further diversify audiences and grow and therefore grow them, right, um, that will be of great support to these theaters that you know, should continue to be on their journeys of inclusion, of diversification, of whatever journey they're on, um, but it is only with like a more and a more diverse audience, um, I think that this field will continue to thrive yeah. as it has in the mm -hmm. last 20 years. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen, is there anything that you wanna share about yeah. a vision for service? Yeah, I mean, we just have been through a strategic planning process over the last like about a year and a half to two years. And, um, and we had this sort of soul searching moment of here's a producer, we're a presenter, and we're a venue. And we had this soul searching moment about how important our venue was to our mission and the artists that we serve. And we ultimately, like, we examined, like, what if we sold the space? Then we would have money that we could invest in artist work for many years. What if we, um, shared the space with another entity 50% of the time. What if we, like, we went through all these different exercises. We ultimately decided we want to keep our space. We actually think a home 
that is a permanent home for artists that's outside a commercial marketplace is a really important thing to be able to offer to artists in New York City at this time, that it is of paramount value. Yeah. Um, so then we start looking at, okay, what are, the, what are the resources that we need to develop in order to keep that venue operating? And we had had a model for a while that showed what the cost was to operate the space versus what, the, what income we could generate from our, having guests in our place at a subsidized rate. And what, what we've gotten to post-COVID is that we basically lose about $150,000 a year operating our space with the rates that we have but we know that the groups that we're working with who are small nonprofit groups don't have more resource. So we've got to find other resource to balance that equation. Yeah. So basically what we've been doing is looking at like, okay, in our producing model, these are what the needs and the demands are. In, in our presenting model, this is what they are. In, a, in our venue, looking them as three separate threads and figuring out, yes, there are places where those overlap with each other, but there are a lot of places where we could be generating the appropriate resources for that area by not thinking of it all together. Mm. So it was really like separating the threads and thinking through that. Now our producing model is also in relationship to what Will's talking about, our residency program. We have artists in residence with us for two to three years and we support them organically in their process from inception through work in progress workshop, fully premiere the work and help launch it on tour. Every artist process is different and here right now, puts the same resource into each project, and then we partner with the artist to develop what the appropriate budget is for the project and generate the re raise the resources to make the projects happen. This has worked pretty well for years. Post-pandemic, with all of the way that we're trying to address equity across all of the artists working on projects, overhauling our budgets and looking at how to really be fair, instead of doing most favored nations that all designers are paid the same, figuring out, oh, if this video designer is actually creating an enormous amount of content and the costume designer is designing one costume, it actually isn't fair that they're paid the same thing. It's mm -hmm. not the same workload. So we've, we've, on each budgeting process now, we talk through what the needs are gonna be for every designer and for every artist that's working on the project. And we're looking at an hourly amount for each artist on the project and we're estimating. Mm -hmm. And it's not exact um, and we've, messed this up and then we figured out how to overhaul it. Um, you know, you want to, we, we tried doing everything completely hourly, but that really doesn't work because an artist is setting aside time for three months or something, right? And they need to know that there's a certain base level of revenue that they're gonna have. And so if they end up not working as much because the rehearsal schedule was less, that's just not fair. So we're not doing that anymore. So there's a base level that we're paying everybody, but if we go over the hours that we estimated, we're paying people more. That's great for artists. That is hard for an institution that has a budget in place and things may change. I just had a show that we had COVID um, strike seven members of a 15 person company. And so my costs were so much higher because of lost time, paying people for not working, having other people come in to replace. I think that my costs increased by about $20,000 over that period of dealing with that. It was completely unexpected. Um, so there's some real tricks um, and things that I haven't figured out <laughs> about how to address the issues that we're trying to address in industry without the resources that we have, how to be as flexible and supportive, but also protect the long-term health and well-being of the institution. Um, and not at the expense of the artist, but so that it can continue to serve the artist. Yeah. So, so that's what I think for us has been a really big wrestle. Um, and um, I still have optimism about how we get to the other side of it, but I myself am not seeing the easy solution and not to be binary, because I totally agree with you, because I'm the queen of optimism. That's my superpower, is optimism. <laughs> That's how I've been able to keep doing this. Yes. But, but I, I myself am really, I thought I was working towards the solution, and then I've tripped over so many new issues with the solutioning that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but maybe it's also about staying on that path, right? Like, yeah. not mm -hmm. not that you're going to get to the end of it, but that you're building resilience right. to like trip over something and try something else. Yeah. Trip over yeah. it, learn from it, trip again. You know, I think that we lose. I, I find as a leader, um, when I am not at my best, it's because I desperately want to get to the next 
point mm -hmm. and I'm mm -hmm. there for like not learning anything from yeah, that yeah, together. Yeah. It sounds mm -hmm. like you all are learning a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. An element of letting go of control is yeah. killer. <laughs> yes. Talk about challenges. Yeah. Really, really um, hard. But really, it's where the magic happens, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've got, oof, we've got 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to ask you all a quick question. Would you rather do a round robin, or would you rather try to take a couple questions from the audience? What feels better? Take some yeah. questions. Take some questions. Yeah. All right. Audience. Hi, folks. We've got, yes, I see you. OK, very good. We've got our first one over there. Um, we, we have um, 10, which is really 15 minutes, right, uh, before we'll have to conclude this. Um, Nikki is going to help and pass a mic. I think that means we've probably got um, two questions in us. So I see Amy, I can't see where you're from, over here. If you could just quickly share uh, your name, even though I've already said it, uh, the, uh, the theater that you're from, and then your question, and we'll answer it, and then we'll do one more. Amy Harris, Amit Theater. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am an interim executive director. I'm taking over from a long-serving executive director and um, going through a hiring process. I'm very curious from both the side that was hiring and the side that was hired, are there particular questions that allowed you to share your vision during the interview or particular structure that allowed for a really organic conversation? What a great question. Great question. Um, can we all, because this, this gets to a role that each of us has played probably many times, um, can everybody give one answer for Amy? This is such a, that's such a great question. Yeah, Deeksha, I'm going to make you all start. Right. Um, so uh, uh, the, hire, the search firm that did my search told me every question I was going to be asked before I was asked it Yes. in all the rounds of the interviews. And that was a game changer for me. Yes. It really was. Mm -hmm. um, it allowed me to prep exact, it allowed me to understand the quirks, not be thrown off by like quirky questions. It allowed me to prepare. Um, a, it's a joke at TDF, the, the like interview deck, because it allowed me to prepare a little deck because that's how I wanted to organize my thoughts. It was, um, it was incredibly valuable. So whatever the questions are, letting people know in advance is a great, great um, step from their point of view. And it builds trust early on. Yeah. I, and I think the being communicative about what the whole process is as opposed to shrouding things in mystery and being really transparent about pay, being really transparent about job descriptions, being really transparent about taking questions around this in a, in a way that is welcoming and open. Um, and, and saying like, okay, we're gonna have a process where you're meeting with three board members. We're gonna have a process where you're gonna meet with staff members. We're gonna have a process where you're gonna be in a mixed environment with both those constituencies and we're gonna throw artists into the mix. And like just talking about what the various exposure points are make people feel like they understand values more of your organization and they can figure out if that's the right fit for them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with both these things, being able to prepare ahead of time. It also tells me something about the organization, that they knew what they wanted to ask, and it means everyone has had to gather and discuss. And one thing in particular I noticed that did in, in my search process is it, is it meant that there had, there had to have been agreement about the ethics and values we have around questions and the questions we're going to ask and the questions we are not going to ask in these like various different groups that might have very different opinions. Mm -hmm. And I, I also agree that that's, that small meeting structure of now we are gonna talk about development, now we are, you know, that, that, re that it, it actually I think is a helpful brain thing to be like, yes, now my prepped questions about that, thank you, turning that off. So that it just allowed, um, even though it added time, it was less exhausting mm -hmm. than having to speak to a big group always. Um, we, Art New York did not work with a search firm to hire the wonderful Talia Corin, who's just joined us in the back. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very happy to talk to, to you, Amy, to anyone about how we work together as a staff and board and how we involved our members 
uh, and some of our funders and some other stakeholders in developing our search process. Um, but the thing that the answer that I would give you that I think is very much in, in alignment with what these wonderful folks have said is that um, whether you work with a firm or not, um, finding opportunities for staff and board to work together to create a vision that's shared in advance of what the job is, which is just, I think, another way of saying the job description. Um, but again, letting that come from within and from a group comprised of staff and board, I, I know that that allowed us um, to be successful, by which I mean not just that we like hired, again, someone who has you know, become an incredible part of our organization and led it in new directions, but it also brought our staff and board closer together mm -hmm. in a moment where there's so often an opportunity for dis divisiveness, which is not productive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have, yes, we have time for one more. Who will it be? I, oh, I'm gonna go to this side of the room. Arbitrarily, that's you in the back with your hand. And again, Jessica. please share your name, uh, the theater that you are from, and then ask your question. Hi, first, thank you for this. It's yeah. fierce. Um, I'm Jessica Burr. I'm the artistic director of Blessed Unrest. And um, addressing time is just, that's the thing that I'm wrestling with the most in terms of how to incorporate that into the organization in a different way. And I'm going to try to like be super clear about this because it's a little bit um, layered. So we have performance requirements um, because of grants, right? We have to perform within our fiscal and their calendar years yep. or we don't get NISC or DCA. Um, and with the, with the Actors Union, we are 25 years old because we have produced under an equity showcase code for that long. That's how we've survived. Under that code, we can, we're cut off at 16 performances. We're also given limited rehearsal time if we are to do it legally, God forbid. Um, and there's another, there's another part to this, which is recognition. Um, and that's not why I do this, but um, awards and reviews are currency in our world and also in the world of audiences. Um, and we are not eligible for any sort of awards of significance um, until we have 17 or 18 performances. I can't remember exactly the number. So it just feels like the um, structures that ostensibly exist to support our organizations are really formed to keep the small, the small people down. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Thank you so much. Um, this is where, I, again, I'll remind us I'm not an artist, I'm not a producer. Uh, you folks uh, who work with audiences, who work with artists, um, what do you have a response to share? Hmm. Also not an artist yes. uh, at all. Um, I think, you know, in that re realm of reframing, I think I have a lot of questions, which I'm happy to chat with you about, mm -hmm. you know, later, but, you know, it's, it's a, as my friend Mike said, it's okay if it doesn't happen all at once, or it's yeah. okay if it takes a little longer. And I guess my question to you is, how are you planning for the place you want to be? So where do you actually want to be? And what are the steps that you need to take to get there? And it may be a three-year process, it may be a five-year process, but uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start with the false sort of binary of time or whatever. I'm sorry if I'm using mixing me metaphors, but this idea that you know, it's w let's start with where you want to go and where you want to be, and let's break down the problem of what are the things that are you getting in your way. Mm -hmm. And then let's solve them one by one. And by the way, that means letting go. I mean, the hardest conversations we've been having at TDF is that, you know, sometimes it, we have to let go of things that we love. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just always, always challenging. So it's sort of like, what are you willing to let go? What do you do less well than the other things you do? I don't know, you know, so, without getting into the weeds of it, these are the kinds of questions I would sort of approach, mm -hmm. approach, approach the problem with. Mm. I have two thoughts. Oh, you no, go. Go ahead. Uh, I have two thoughts. Um, the, uh, the first is, if you've been doing this for this long, it sounds like you have generally a sense of what the, the pot of resources is. And if that is the case, uh, that really just building off of your point, then what would happen if you like kind of scrapped it for 
parts and thought about what, what are the other things this pot of money does. And not just pot of money, but the footprint of our resources. Like just, uh, and as a thought experiment, let go of these are the like percentile shifts we could make to that, but actually what does that money and resource pay for or support in a completely different world? Just as a thought to then be able to compare those two things. Mm. And the second thing I would say, and this is I think, I have no idea if this is what you speak of when you speak of the um, uh, grants that you might be working with, but there's this real trap which is creating a program that fits the grant. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you never have to accept an invitation, you know? You could be like, I don't wish to go to that party. I am having this party. And just from an organizational level, that sort of like money in, money out, that doesn't take into account all of the money you are actually going to spend for the pleasure of having this small amount of money to run this program that you have tailored for that grant. And so I think it's a, it's a very scary thing, but it is also a like, ooh, can we zoom out for a second and look at what systems are in place and ingrained because of a particular pot of money that comes to us? And can we just for a moment, just in our minds, have a question about, do we like that? Yes. Right. You know? Yes. Right. Right. And see if that might help uh, unclose a loop. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my thought. Yep. Just to build on that, it's about how to work outside the system. Don't let the system define the box that you're working inside. Make your own box. And I understand, like, so I work in multi multidisciplinary work. So a lot of times I'm outside equities jurisdiction because I'm working with opera singers, or I'm working with puppeteers, or I'm working with dancers who aren't under their jurisdiction. So then I can work in whatever method is appropriate to those artists in that situation. So mm -hmm. you know that, that frees me of whatever that limitation is, right? Yeah. So, so, so I, I know your work and that you work in, a, a, I'd say, a, a physical theater or dance theater form. Maybe there are some projects where there are no equity performers on the project. There are tons of great non-equity performers who you could work with. I'm not trashing equity. Nobody beat me up. But I'm just <laughs> saying, for your particular, for your particular need, um, maybe there's a project that that's the right fit for. So then you're not limited to the 16 performances. You can go to 21 and you can be open for the Lortels or the other awards that you're wanting to be seen for, right? So you're outside that box. So just think about each, it, it's building on what Will's saying, thinking about the principle of each thing that you're making and how you make, is this what you mean to make and are you making it on the terms that you want to make it? Mm -hmm. and make it on your terms, not on I theirs. That. that is the beautiful yeah. thing about this moment. One of the things that we can hold on or, or take advantage of is no one can tell you, do it like it's been done, mm -hmm. because all we can say is, that stopped working. That, right. yes. yeah. So, right. I mean, my feeling is like, when chaos reigns, that is the perfect it moment. It be liberation. Yes. yes. That is the <laughs> golden opportunity. Perfect moment yeah. to, to say, ha ha, this is what I would like to do. And the relief that will come from a group of people who are like, chaos is reigning, but that person is saying a thing, <laughs> will line up behind that because it feels terrible to be like this. I'm just, I'm just saying the systems, we're so fortunate right now because no one can tell you the systems are working. And so, mm -hmm. and that's only going to last so long, you that's know? Right. Yes. 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 This yes. Is yes. <laughs> pass. It will it pass. Take, right. take full advantage. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I would. I would only add to this, and I. I say this not specifically to you, Jessica, in in, in terms of what you said, but to everyone. If you're really up against, if you really do feel like you're up against a constraint, right? If you've tried widening your aperture, as everyone has suggested, if you've tried, you know you know, framing um, the, the goal as what do I want and that's not working. If you really just feel like you're butting up against someone else's constraint, so then ask them what happens if you do something else. Right. You know, for, don't live under a fantasy that if you 
obey the rule, if you don't obey the rule, something terrible will happen. Yes. Ask the person that you perceive as making the rule, what happens if I break your rule? We yeah. just did that. <laughs> yeah. We just did that yes. last week with a very big foundation you all know about. And we call and said, like, this, yeah. this thing, we, we think this thing, this constraint is really making a massive problem. And the response was, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, we don't. Yeah. Whatever, let that go. Right. <gasps> Most of the time, when I've also done this, the person has been very generous and also said, oh, I didn't want that for you. Right. Let's talk about how to get to your yes. Um, most of the time, that is what has happened. And on the off chance where someone has like stuck to their constraint for whatever reason, we've still found another way. Yeah. Because then we, because that has been the th the key that we needed to unlock our vision and figure out um, what it is that we really want, as all these guys are suggesting. And advocate mm. together, like yeah. Justin, mm. get, gather your fellow companies that are dealing with the same challenge, and 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 we've all we've all tried to reform different aspects of the field at different times, That's but right. I have found that progress has been made yes. through working together and partnerships. 100%. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, unfortunately, folks, I'm sorry, I see more hands. Uh, I know, we've, we've sort of like unleashed a beast here. Uh, <laughs> but we have a very hard stop, and uh, I cannot let us go without saying some thank yous. First and foremost, to all of you for being here, for listening, for sharing. Um, uh, and for all the conversations that I know will come next, mm -hmm. um, because even though we have to stop this piece of the, the day right now, um, I'll certainly be around later. I'm sure these folks will, you know, and, and certainly all of you will. So keep having this conversation, please and thank you. Nikki, thank you so much for your steadfast coordination and care. Um, to our friends at Hands On, thank you for translating for us. Um, Transcend Streaming and HowlRound, thank you for allowing this to be accessible to all of our friends in TV land. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to the folks um, managing live captioning for us. And absolutely 100%, thank you Deeksha, and thank you Kristen, and thank you Will for your vulnerability, <laughs> for your creativity. Um, and for your presence. Mm -hmm. it, this was a sheer delight. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you, you so Risa. Much. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, you Risa. Thank you. Um, and you're all very welcome. Enjoy the rest of the day. Please come to the vendor fair this evening and rejoin us tomorrow for day two of the summit. Thank you yeah, all. So all right. Also, um, for the sake of my hair, I'm actually posting Okay, that's okay. Um, And our lovely vendors need to connect <laughs> to the Wi-Fi. So if you are staying for the vendor fair, just turn off your Wi-Fi. It would be very helpful. Um, and we're having another panel tomorrow at 12 PM called The Advocators Fighting for Pay Equity. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are so excited um, to have you all back for that. And we'll see you later. Great. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Where, where are you going to fall?